Good morning, spaceflight fans and UFO enthusiasts. For once, I have a video well suited to both of you. For those of you who are not huge spaceflight enthusiasts, you may not be aware that recently Starship took flight in the skies of South Texas and ultimately splashed down in the Indian Ocean. Also, the booster, also known as Super Heavy, safely splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico in a big step forward in making making Starship a reusable spacecraft. However, you may also be aware of the fact that the heat shield on Starship didn't exactly hold up perfectly. And although Elon would have us believe that the flaps on Starship were not supposed to survive, that the flaws in the flaps have already been corrected on future versions, future iterations, and that maybe the heat shield held up just fine aside from these flaps, well, I don't know, that may not be the case. I think that SpaceX may still have a bit of a ways to go on their heat shield. And even though a number of people pointed out during my recent analysis that comparing Starship's heat shield to the Space Shuttle's heat shield in 1981 is not a fair comparison to be making because the Space Shuttle in 1981 was a finished product, whereas this is definitely a prototype, well, I think it's also fair then to compare the performance of the heat shield in 2024 on Starship with the performance of Orion's heat shield in 2014. No, not on the maiden flight of SLS in 2022, 2014, where an Orion spacecraft, which was most definitely a prototype at that time, was launched into a parabolic trajectory by a Delta IV Heavy. The Delta IV launched Orion into this trajectory so that it would re-enter at a very high velocity, not quite the same as a lunar re-entry trajectory, but still much faster than an orbital trajectory in order to put the heat shield on Orion through its paces. And in 2014, 10 years ago, Orion's heat shield performed extremely well. A huge step forward in the development of this spacecraft, and yet in 2022, Orion still was experiencing problems with its heat shield, and this may delay the advent of humans riding this spacecraft in 2025. So clearly, we're not all polished brass when it comes to heat shields here. It is a process, and it is a very difficult process. And no matter how much progress you may have made on heat shields, there could still be a long ways to go in development before Starship is actually ready to take human beings through the atmosphere during a re-entry. That being the case then, SpaceX could probably use all the materials help that they could get. And this is where UFOs and Avi Loeb come in, amazingly enough. And no, I'm not about to start talking crazily about a supposed UFO wreck, supposed materials recovered from a UFO years ago that was subsequently snapped up by the government or something. I'm talking about materials that have been gathered from the crash site of an unidentified object that hit our planet back in 2014. And once again, a quick refresher, back in 2014, an interstellar meteor or some kind of object that came from an interstellar destination hit our atmosphere and pierced the atmosphere down to a very low altitude, just a little north of where jet airliners tend to fly. Very few meteors hold together for that long in our atmosphere and especially fail to hold together if they are traveling at such an enormous velocity. How fast are we talking? About 216,000 kilometers per hour. By way of comparison, Starship was traveling at 26,000 kilometers per hour, not 226,000, 26,000 kilometers per hour when it made its re-entry a few days ago. This thing was traveling many times faster, and anything that's going that fast should have burned up in the very high atmosphere and not have pierced down to the level where commercial airliners tend to fly. And yet, amazingly enough, it did. 
This was an unprecedented event. Whatever this object is, known as IM-1, or rather whatever the object was, is far, far more resilient than any meteor that has ever been recorded hitting our atmosphere. Just to make another comparison, there was a meteor that re-entered over Spain and Portugal on May 18th of 2024. It had an entry speed of 40 kilometers per second, about two-thirds as fast as IM-1 was traveling, and exploded at an altitude of 74 kilometers, where the air density is a thousand times less than the explosion altitude of IM-1, implying that the yield material strength of IM-1 was a thousand times higher and tougher than all known iron meteorites. Now wait just a damn minute, I hear some of you say. There are quite a number of meteors that survive all the way to the ground. What the hell am I talking about? Well, this particular meteor was only one to two meters in diameter. And any comparable meteor, the same size, traveling anywhere near the same velocity, simply should not have survived that long. Whatever this object was made out of was incredibly resilient. And it is for this reason that Dr. Avi Loeb and his colleagues at the Galileo Project, I also want to be very clear about this. It's not just Avi Loeb and a group of his sycophants that went on this trip. There are a lot of extremely well-educated professionals who contributed to this expedition and also the subsequent analysis of what they found. A large number of spherules at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean where the object hit our planet back in 2014. Spherules that are very similar to the types of spherules one would expect to find in the aftermath of a meteorite impact. However, the composition of these spherules was very strange indeed. They contained a number of unusual elements including beryllium and uranium, the type of material one would expect to find inside nuclear reactors, not inside conventional, ordinary, natural meteorites. Now, once again, I want to emphasize, Avi Loeb is not claiming right now that this was an alien spacecraft. He is instead putting forward a number of theories, postulating how these types of materials might have ended up in an interstellar meteorite, perhaps forming inside a white dwarf or other stellar systems that are very different from a composition perspective than our own solar system. But nevertheless, always in the back of his mind, there is no question that Dr. Loeb is thinking that this might be the product of an extraterrestrial civilization, especially if one considers that it pierced our atmosphere very, very effectively, far better than the heat shields of many spacecraft that we make use of today. And it is for this reason that Dr. Loeb, a few days ago, received an email from Dr. Robert Syker who interviewed him on his podcast not too long ago. Robert asked, quote, Are the spherules of the interstellar meteor IM-1 made of an alloy that is more heat and pressure resistant than other earthly alloys or alloys found in solar sister system meteorites? If so, can the alloy be used as a heat shield for Elon Musk's starship? Musk has frequently emphasized that an effective heat shield for starship is difficult to make and the stability and effectiveness of the heat shield is one of the main tests of the next starship flight tomorrow unquote and this was just before the fourth flight of starship and once again keep in mind the material strength of im1 was unprecedented among all previously known meteors from the solar system since it maintained its integrity down to an altitude of 19 kilometers there's a very good chance that some larger pieces of this object may have survived all the way down to the bottom of the South Pacific, not just a few small spherules. It is for this reason that Dr. Loeb has attained enough grant money to go on a second expedition to try to find larger fragments. 
Now, it's important to note that the three elements that were discovered in some of these spherules, beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium, by the way, lanthanum is a metal that also has a variety of industrial applications. These are not the only elements that were in this meteorite. The spherules were less than a millimeter in size, and they lost their volatile elements during the meteor's explosion. So we don't know their entire chemical composition and won't until later larger fragments are found, which hopefully happens during this second expedition when the Galileo project will have access to a submersible with cameras and other sensing equipment that will allow them to find these larger fragments if they do indeed still exist. And as Loeb points out, quote, bigger pieces of IM-1 will enable a complete laboratory analysis of their material strength and thermal conduction properties irrespective of whether IM-1 was artificial or natural in origin. So yeah, very cool to see Avi Loeb still talking about an artificial origin here. Its material properties can provide new insights into the optimal design of the heat shield for Starship. In case IM-1 was a technological probe, its senders might have incorporated material design beyond our technological knowledge. In the case of natural origin, like the spaghetti getification of a magma ocean planet, which by the way is one of the theories that Avi Loeb came up with as to a possible reason that a meteor would have this kind of composition, nature may have gifted us with a unique preparation process that we can reproduce in our laboratories. Can astronomy help space entrepreneurship on Earth? In tomorrow's launch, Starship will first move through the Earth's atmosphere in the opposite direction to that taken by the interstellar meteor IM-1. The material physics that allowed IM-1 to survive at a much higher speed than that of Starship could help us to visit alien worlds. I think that Dr. Loeb is absolutely right about this. To my knowledge, no heat shield has ever been created that could possibly survive re-entry through an atmosphere as thick as ours at a speed of a quarter of a million kilometers per hour. We haven't even attempted anything like that, and we probably never will. And Dr. Loeb's motivations here are obvious. Elon Musk has said over and over again that he's seen no evidence whatsoever of intelligence with an extraterrestrial origin. He's also said that he would know if something like this did exist given how many satellites he sends up into orbit and all the cameras he has on board his various Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy spacecraft, etc. And yet he has seen no evidence that anything like this exists. Well, I think Avi Loeb would like to put his ideas to the test because something very clearly hit our planet in 2014 that was extremely unusual, completely inconsistent with any object that has an origin within in our own solar system and whether it's natural or artificial it has the potential of solving one of elon musk's most significant challenges in creating a fully reusable spacecraft that will revolutionize spaceflight forever i would like to thank the following awesome folks thomas Wallstrom, also Donnie Counts, also Auntie Bell 27, who by the way joined at the Dream Chaser level. Thank you so much. Also, I would like to thank S. Adams for joining as a Patreon supporter and Mike Bundy as well. And also, I would like to thank Chris Garris for bumping up his membership level to the Lunar Starship level. Thank you so much. And Chris, keep in mind, you get to select a video topic that I will use this quarter. Just go ahead and choose a topic, post it in the Patreon thread, and I will make sure to create a video within reason, of course, about whatever UFO or spaceflight topic you would like to see. And if you would like to join our growing family of Patreon supporters and get me to that 1% level that will change everything that I can do for this channel, including visiting the National Archives in person to dig up UFO content that the archives is stubbornly not digitizing right now. Well, all the details are in the description. And please like, 
please subscribe and also please try to watch those ads for at least 30 seconds as you see them. I know you hate them. I hate them too. But in any event, I get compensated a lot more if you watch those ads for just 30 seconds. Keep all of that in mind. And as always, stay angry about space.